It's no secret that the Modern Warfare trilogy ended poorly. Jason West and Vince Sampella had left Infinity War to form Respawn just months after the release of Modern Warfare 2, a game that the two creative directors had full control of. The game was of course a giant success, and had the two stayed instead of getting into their legal dispute with Activision and Bobby Kotick, they would have kept control. They would have even had the authority to simply say no to another entry. But that's not what happened. The creative leads and several dozen other developers, who had all created the Call of Duty series initially, and led the way with Modern Warfare, had gone. And low Activision was sitting on a gold mine, they now had only a half-size Infinity Ward to exploit it. So they enlisted the help of Sledgehammer Games, a new company founded by Dead Space's Glenn Schofield and Michael Condry, splitting developer duties with what remained of Infinity Ward. So, one half of the people responsible for this third entry were remnants of a dying studio, and the other half were a brand new team, headed by people best known for a third person horror game. Not a fantastic setup, is it? But Activision only had 20 months to get a new title out, and they couldn't push it back. The Call of Duty train was well and truly rolling by this point, and there was no way they would put on the brakes. Another in the highly, highly lucrative Modern Warfare series was commissioned, West and Zampella be damned. So that's the background. I was going to forego all of this and go straight into the game, but the more I read about everything that was going on at the time, the more it all became very clear and relevant just why this game is so lacking. The game had no central creative voice behind it essentially, and this is something any big artistic project like this cannot do without. Well, I say that, but apparently they can, because Modern Warfare 3 was the single biggest launch in entertainment history at the time, taking it a billion dollars in just over two weeks. But that doesn't mean it's a good game, does it? Well, these fuckers thought it was. Eights and nines across the board. Unbelievable, considering what a lazy, generic warfest this thing was. This game is a depressingly innovationless, dull, numbing, idiotic and childish footnote in gaming history, and revealed to many just what the critics of Call of Duty had already started to fear by this point, that the series was an endless, cynical, xenophobic behemoth whose initial pretensions to be the military shooter equivalent to fun, dumb action blockbusters was actually a thin pretext to hash out the same product over and over, closer to FIFA or madder than anything with ideas. I was about 16 when Modern Warfare 3 came out, which is the perfect age for COD's fast-paced, addictive, military gunwank. And I did love it. Call of Duty always put out a quality product, and they were all considerably different. From the first Modern Warfare's morally ambiguous spy plot, to the outright horror of World at War, to the Hans Zimmer scored colourful action adventure of Modern Warfare 2. These games always had high production values and undeniable polish. But even then, there were problems slipping in. Merely the fact that there were so many was becoming a problem. The gun mechanics never really changed, so they kept pushing things forward by upping the scale of things and keeping you quiet with flashy toys. It worked for a time, but Modern Warfare 3 was where it could go on no longer. Immediately, there's something not quite right with how this game starts. It's tired from the first level. With only a quick preamble, you're thrown into an aggressively desaturated New York shooting gallery, using the exact same weapons from the previous title. Any semblance of pacing is just gone and, okay, I get it, this is World War 3, the world's gone crazy, and it wants to throw you in where you left off, but holy shit, let me get acclimatised first. Giving players a chance to watch things unwind in real time before ramping up the action is something this game is far too scared to attempt. And perhaps it wouldn't bother me so much if this first big street fight encounter was unique, but it's not. Pushing through wide brown corridors with characterless American soldiers is what half of this game is. You'll do it in New York, you'll do it in Hamburg, you'll do it in Berlin, you'll do it in Paris. Push up a street, maybe turn a corner or two, shoot the endless mass of Russians and wait for the cutscene to tell you to stop. The locations change but things stay the same. But that's only half the campaign, the other half is the sneaky Captain Price SAS stuff. The stealth missions from the previous titles were often the best parts of those games, and Modern Warfare 3 knows this, that's why it makes you do five of them. Well, not full stealth missions, this game doesn't have the attention span for that. Everything turns into a ridiculous shooting gallery within minutes, and the characters aren't phased by it anyway. 
Do you remember the slow pace and atmosphere in Pripyat? The feeling that you're in real danger if you're caught? Restraint can be a powerful tool. Not going all out can make the moments where you do all the more impressive. Why did Africa start exploding all over the place when you're making your escape? Imagine if that happened in Pripyat after you shot Sakaev. The fact the building explodes means something because it hasn't happened before. When you make your escape, there aren't explosions going on to scare you. There's just the sense that you're two men out of your depth being chased. Much, much more effective than this visual mess. Low stealth missions with price and soap were usually the more characterful and creative sections of those games, but again this one falls flat there too. The problem is there are no new ideas, just recycled ones. There are recycled ideas everywhere in this thing. Most weapons are taken straight from Modern Warfare 2 with only minor cosmetic changes, but even the new ones are just bought back from the first game. But hey, do you remember shooting up militia in a foul vela with chickens in cages and dudes on trucks? Do you remember shooting up guys in a room full of screens? Do you remember scuba diving? Do you remember steering a raft? Do you remember AC-130? Do you remember crawling under a truck? Do you remember the javelin? Do you remember breaching? It's more fun when there's free things on the door, right? Do you remember predator drones? Well, now they're in colour. Now that's what I call innovation. There are some new toys, sure, but they're all given and taken away within the span of minutes. Less, actually. That mortar section goes on for 25 seconds. The attention span it thinks the player is working with is truly something to behold. The real problem with these toys though is that there aren't levels designed around them like the previous titles often had. You're not allowed to use them on your own terms. They don't seem to understand that it's not the toys themselves that are fun, it's the opportunities that they afford gameplay, getting one up on your foe. I mean all of this stuff is token, even the night vision goggles. Technically you're in control of them but it'll tell you when to put them on and when to take them off. If you don't put them on, you can see anyway, and if you keep them on longer than you should, they'll just despawn them off of your face. There were times in the previous games where they were actually useful. They were part of gameplay. Here though, the key word is token, plain and simple. Everything new that they can think to throw at you is something you've seen before that they've tried to up the ante on. Like the Nine Banger. Am I supposed to be impressed that it bangs more? Yet the set pieces is where this game reveals itself to be truly out of ideas. It's got a lot of them, everyone trying to outdo the rest, but ultimately they fall flat because the context behind them is lacking. Think about that train sequence. It's pretty spectacular, it's a fun idea too and well done visually, but what are we doing it for? We're in London trying to stop a chemical weapons attack and the weapons are in a truck. So why are we chasing after this train and causing way more collateral damage than any terrorist attack would? and the truck arrives anyway, regardless of all of this nonsense. I'm not even sure what happens to this particular truck, we just cut to the vacation footage of an American family enjoying a lovely holiday while their homeland burns, and a truck blows up, killing a kid because a little controversy in the news is always good for publicity, right? But why weren't we trying to stop this truck too? They saw dozens of them leave that depot. I guess this is one that slipped through and the one headed for Westminster we stopped? No, wait, because it says here the Westminster attack succeeded, so what was the point in any of this? And that brings us to... To have such innovationless gameplay is bad enough, but what really seals the deal on what a train wreck this game is, is what they do with this story, and it was already pretty thin to begin with. It continues exactly where Modern Warfare 2 left off. And by continues, I mean exactly that, it just carries on. It's more of the same. America is still under siege and Soap has been airlifted away after killing Shepard. He's healed pretty much instantly, so we jump back into the same setup, alternating between Americans being complete morons but ultimately winning anyway, and Price and Soap globetrotting around, chasing after people with a connection to Makarov. All of which is simply an excuse to take you all over the planet on a shooting spree. A grey, brown shooting spree. Now these stories have always been pretty dumb. They're Tom Clancy novels with half the pages missing. But it's always had a story you could at least follow if you wanted more context for the action. You could listen to the load screens and understand the progression of things. So let's try to see what's happening in this one. 
In the previous game, a CIA infiltrated terrorist attack gets blamed on the Americans, and Russia is out for blood. Okay. Little far-fetched, but that's fine. It's an excuse for big events and set pieces. No problem. Invading the whole of the US was a bit silly, but it's a fun idea and the motivation makes sense. Which is important. Motivations are important. And not just the motivations of characters, but the motivations of whole factions. Where allegiances lie and what people are fighting for is important. Now tell me, what does Makarov want? At the beginning of this, the Russian president is on his way to a peace talk. Listen to him and he sounds like fucking Gandhi. Gentlemen, we have only two choices. Peace or war. Life or death. For the sake of our children. If he doesn't want this, why doesn't he simply pull his troops out? He planned and launched this whole war, now he's got some high-minded ideal about it all? Makarov captures him in an admittedly impressive little level, and says he doesn't want peace. He wants Russia to invade Europe. Russia will take all of Europe, even if it must stand upon a pile of ashes. Alright, he's got the president, but what sway does Makarov have? Makarov is essentially his own faction, though. He's an ultra-nationalist who wants to make Russia great again, I suppose? But who in Russia launches this invasion after the president goes missing? Makarov can't be in charge because he's a known terrorist who, by the way, is on camera shooting up the airport. What is the ultimate goal for him? What's the ultimate goal of the Russians in general? Purely revenge? Why attack Europe then? Expansionism? So they've just lost their insanely costly war against America, and now they're ready for a full-scale invasion of all of Europe. Why would anyone in Russia want to do this? Half of this game is about chasing Makarov from place to place, trying to kill him, but at one point it's about trying to stop this chemical weapon attack he launches. But are Makarov's terrorist organisation and the Russian government the same thing? The game makes no real distinction here. Apparently they're not the same, so why did Makarov's gas attack coincide with the invasion? Do the Russian army agree with this approach? Well, they're happy to gun down civilians, so I guess aside from the president, Nikolai and Yuri, every single Russian is just pure evil. <sighs> it's all just nonsense. A thin, thin pretext to shoot the evil bad guys in as many places as possible. And yeah, you might say I'm taking it too seriously, I'm overanalyzing it, but this is the entire context for what I'm doing as a player. It doesn't have to be complicated, it just has to make some bloody sense. The other games weren't complicated, but they got those basic things right. There's a point where you have to rescue the Russian president's daughter from the Russians. Who has her? Makarov's people? But they're backed up by the Russian army. Why are the Russians fighting against people trying to save their president and his innocent daughter? I just don't understand this. The motivations are just so tangled. Who do they think has captured their president? Who's calling the shots in Moscow with the president missing? It's a little suspect he went missing on the way to a peace talk, no? Should probably delay that invasion for at least a little bit. The confusion around factions and their motivations extends to the actually written characters too. I simply can't quite figure out who Price and Soap are actually working for throughout this game. They're Task Force 141, but disavowed. Okay, so they're an independent thing now, yes? Funded by who? Who are they talking to on these loading screens? Delta, I guess, but they're American special forces, so why are they working with these renegades? What does the British government think about Price fucking around like this? I've racked my brain trying to make sense of this story, but I just give up. It's clear I thought about it more than the developers did. The main things to get across is that Russia is bad, and the Americans especially are valiant heroes. They're so heroic that they can hop over the Atlantic just moments after their nation has been invaded and flattened to come save all of Europe as well. The armies of Britain, France, Germany, the Czech Republic and the rest of Europe are helpless without them apparently. It's incredibly masturbatory and I know why they've done it of course, it's because the game is made by and being sold primarily to Americans, but for the love of Christ, have us play as French special forces in Paris. Let us play as the Germans in Hamburg and Berlin. The only time they even touch on the wider implications of this conflict outside of the gallant American warriors or British James Bond characters is when you and Soap are wandering around Prague and there's a friendly militia force going to war against the Russians. It's cool, I like this part, it's effective, it lends emotional weight to the plot. I don't know why they couldn't lean into it more, show the price of this sort of conflict. 
Well, I suppose you're selling us to teenagers. Can't let any emotions get in the way of the brainless shooting galleries. Until Soap gets injured and Price emotionally screams for a medic while thousands of civilians die around them. It's a trope of this sort of thing that of course the main characters are the most important thing, but here it's just shameful. So the gameplay sucks and the story sucks. What else is there? Well, the overall visual design sucks. The reuse of animations and HUD elements means this game fails to distinguish itself stylistically from the others. Well, it's actually worse than that. Things look far blander than before. Despite improvements to the engine and the realistic particles they throw all over the place, the crushing desaturation and lack of creative or colourful lighting means this thing is artistically bereft. The deep blues, yellows and reds of previous titles have gone and left behind grey, brown and sickly green. The only place where they break with convention is that sandstorm, which actually does something unique and interesting by changing up gameplay slightly as you look for flashlights in the haze. There are some good ideas in this, perhaps that's why it's so frustrating because they're all so short and underutilised. You could have had a whole stealth mission in that sandstorm, built some atmosphere, done some sniping, put the characters on the back foot, but nope, they're too worried you'll switch off if you're not allowed to constantly go fully automatic every five minutes. The other thing is the music, which is utterly, utterly forgettable. If you've played Modern Warfare 2, you can almost certainly hum some of the soundtrack. If I show you this piece of music, what comes back? What about this track? Or this one. Now try to remember anything from Modern Warfare 3's soundtrack. There's nothing, is there? Gone are Hans Zimmer and Lorne Balfe's incredible work on the second. Now it's Brian Tyler, known for such works as Alien vs Predator, Requiem, The Expendables, Battle Los Angeles and a hundred other generic action films. He was the right guy for the job, I suppose, if that job was to score generic action nonsense, which it was. What more is there to say about Modern Warfare 3? An unnecessary cash grab from start to finish. Creatively bankrupt entertainment for the masses, with enough explosions and confetti to keep those critics at the time from delving in too deeply before their review deadline the next day. Well, again, I say that, but reading them, you can see that they made much of the same points I'm making now about lack of originality, monotone gameplay, and nonsensical story, but still they gave high scores. No one wants to lose their job with an honest review score now, do they? Eights and nines, please. You won't get invited to private press events otherwise. No wonder people are far more interested these days in what people like Dunkey or Yahtzee have to say than whoever IGN or GameSpot decide to review games on their platform. Well, that is different. You took an entire numeral out of the original title. Better slow down your revolutionary zeal before you start decapitating French monarchs, Activision. Well, that's it. I wanted to delve into this game on behalf of my teenage self who didn't quite have the words to explain what was wrong with it at the time, and although I've done that, I don't think I've actually learned anything. Going back in time to what the gaming landscape was in 2011, symbolised by its idiotic Battlefield vs Call of Duty rivalry, was kind of sad and strange. In some ways it was better, a time before microtransactions where games were shipped without bugs and with several game modes. But this is where it all started, wasn't it? That they got away with making Modern Warfare 2.5 convinced publishers that quality wasn't a necessary prerequisite to making a shit ton of money. It's hard to pinpoint where giant blockbuster games as mere product really kicked off. It's been a feature of the industry for a long time, but I think Modern Warfare 3 certainly emboldened that perspective. Critics praised it for its overall polish and exciting moments, but you'll find very few people, even hardcore Call of Duty fans, who can remember anything about it these days. It was utterly forgettable, but don't forget what it represented and what it still represents. Well, thanks for watching. I know it was a bit of a miserable one this, but it was fun to give this game the critical treatment. Um, subscribe if you like this sort of content, it does take a while to make, so it would be good to know if people want more. 
Um, any suggestions on games that need to be dissected for good or for bad are always welcome. Um, tell me if you agree or disagree, and like the video if you did. Take care everyone. Peace.